good to be in the house of the Lord today, isn't it? Say amen. amen. And those of you out in the cars, under the awning, in the foyer, here in the sanctuary, Facebook Live. I don't know how much longer we'll be on Facebook Live. But I will say this, YouTube, I, I, I tell you what, it's exciting to be a Christian right now. If you agree with that, say amen. amen. Some of you are saying it depends on how you describe and uh, de define exciting. Yeah, well, you got a point there. How many of you uh, love the fact that God is reaching people for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for his church, even during a time of pandemic? You like that? Isn't that exciting? I'm excited to be a part of it. I've been told this morning several more are wanting to come in and unite with us in commitment, in covenant, in fellowship, in membership in this new Christ-centered church. Just a little over seven years old. Glory to God. Church has grown by about 60% during this pandemic. I, I, I really believe, and I hate to be a pronosticator of doom, but I think this pandemic's going to go on and on and on and on and on. So let me just say this, our faith is not in a vaccine, our faith is not in the government, our faith is in the God of the universe, amen? amen. God can use things as tools, as instruments, but we want to welcome you today to receive the word of God. Now last, I know some of you are getting a little nervous because you've looked at the notes and you know we covered one point last week and there's four more. But I assure you, I assure you, trust me. <laughs> we're going to get through it. We're going to get through the last four points of this exciting message. Giant slaying faith. I'm looking back over here. I'm, I'm so glad to see that someone converted Brennan, the guy that played Goliath last week. And he's here today worshiping with us. Thanks for doing that, by the way. Really appreciate that. Park, you played a good David last week. Uh, that worked out really well. Um, okay. So I'm trying to think of how to open this up because again, um, giant slaying faith, we're sitting there and we're going, okay, well, which giant do we focus on that's in our life? You know, for us collectively as a, a community say, well, do you focus on the giant of the pandemic? And, and that's real. Or, or do we focus on the giant of uh, maybe a financial downturn for some within our fellowship? Well, you know, health issues. I mean, do we, beyond that, just normal aches and pains and things we're confronted with, do we focus on that? Do we focus on the relational giants that have crept into our... No, I think in the end, our focus is not on the giant or giants. Our focus is on none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in God, right? Amen? And if we keep our focus on God, and we'll talk about it as one of the points today, if we keep our focus on God and our trust in God, we're going to make it through. We're, we're going to be able to exercise that giant slaying faith. How many of you brought your Bibles today in written form or electronic form? If you did, raise them up high. Let's say it like we mean it. I believe the Bible is God's Word. Inerrant, fallible, inspired, authoritative, relevant. I will, by God's grace. Obey it, Obey it and apply it to my life today. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, I am thrilled. I'm excited, delighted, exhilarated, motivated, fired up to bring the Word of God today. Now, if you see me acting like an old man, it's probably because I am. I'll be 60 this month, as many of you know. Give me the cane stories, give me the I'm going to need a walker stuff. Bring it on, baby. But anyway, if you see me hobbling around crippled today, it's not because I'm turning 60. It's because I worked with some of the finest young adults my wife and I did yesterday. We put two coats of paint on the inside of the young adult building. We got about half of the outside done. Young adults, if you were here yesterday, stand up right now. Congregation, give them a big round of applause. I'm looking. I'm looking, uh, Angela, you are a young adult. You should have stood up. You were here, right there. She was out here. Uh, she was my chief of staff. I was spray man. Thank you to the young adults that assisted pulling hoses, filling paint pails up. It was a lot of fun. Um, so anyway, word of God, 
I want to open up the message with um, this giant that is probably bigger than any other giant of all. And it is the giant one day that we will all face, and it's the giant of death. Because if you hadn't really observed or hadn't really thought about it, there's something we have in common that we all die. And um, as King David talked about, he says, this life is just kind of like a vapor, like a shadow. It's just really brief. And we all die. And that's a huge giant. The good news is that through faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, we literally can avoid eternal death and damnation in hell separated from God. Amen? So if you're here today and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ personally, there is nothing that I say today that will be more important than what I'm saying right now to you. And that is that Jesus Christ offers deliverance from the giant of eternal death. Amen. And I'll tell you clearly how you can slay that giant of death through faith in Jesus Christ. I'll make sure and clearly do that at the end of the service. Last week we looked at giant slaying faith is necessary to slay the giants in your life. And, you know, if you stop and think about it, um, it was that great epic battle between David and that giant, that real giant, Goliath, nine foot, nine inches tall. Let's pick it up in verses 26 through 28. I'll read aloud, you follow along. Then David spoke to the men who were standing by him. What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? The people answered him in accord with his words, saying, Thus it will be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger burned against David. And he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, for you've come down in order to see the battle. From that, what I see, what we can extract, what we can exegete from the word of God is that giant slaying faith is often misunderstood. Maybe you've seen that in your profession. How many public school teachers do we have here in our midst? Okay, several hands going up. You know, sometimes it's hard for you as a Christian, a champion, to live out your Christian faith in a very uh, positive and professional way in the public school system. And your faith, quite frankly, your giant slaying faith is just flat misunderstood. And... Maybe you're a young person and you're involved in school, elementary school or high school or you're in college and uh, your professor just really misunderstands your faith. Uh, he or she doesn't get it that you are a child of God, that your highest guidance for you in your life is not a secular education but is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. That your highest authority given to you by Christ would be the word of God. And this takes precedence over any human textbook that is issued to you. And you're misunderstood. Your faith, your giant slaying faith is misunderstood. I know um, David, all David wanted to do was to stand up for God's righteousness, stand up and defend God's honor. And his older brother, who should have known better, ridiculed him, shamed him. Said, who have you left those few sheep with? You have a little insignificant job, little brother. Take care of a few scraggly sheep. We're out here doing what's important. We're out here fighting for Saul and for Israel. I think Eliab may have been harboring a little bitterness that he was passed over by the prophet Samuel as God's pick. You see, God passed over Eliab 
Eliab, it sounds like from the account earlier on, the previous chapter, he was tall and he would have been a human pick for somebody to be the king in Israel. He was passed over. God said, no, I've not chosen him. And I've not chosen the next oldest brother and the next oldest one, the three that were right there fighting uh, next to Saul. And the, the older brother just attacked and misunderstood David's faith. He said, you're just wanting to be a spectator. You're just coming out here to enjoy the show, to gawk. And he described his faith as stemming from insolence and wickedness of your heart. Your faith, Christian, is often misunderstood. But it's what we do when our faith is misunderstood. Do we cave or do we stand up and with a love in our hearts and resolute and we're resolving that we are not going to waver? I think God wants us to stand up and God wants us not to waver even when our faith is misunderstood and that misunderstanding may even come from people in your own family. Number three. Oh no, wait. I got to share this. I found this. It's just awesome. Uh, in fact, I think Kristen, my daughter, gave me this one. One little tyke's apparent misunderstanding of the term broken home prompted his ad this admonition from his father. He said, the dad goes, I don't care if the basement wall is cracking. Son, stop telling everyone you come from a broken home. <laughs> it somehow relates to that point that your faith will be misunderstood. Thank you, Kristen. Giant slaying faith must be developed. Look at the third point. I'm, I'm getting that right from the text, Samuel 17, 31 through 37. When the words which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul and he sent for him. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Then Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. Please let me pause for one second. How many of you Christians feel like there are so many people saying to you right now, there's no way we can win this battle that's in front of us? Anybody else hearing that right now? Yes, there will always be people who tell you you're too young, you're too old, you don't have enough influence, you don't have enough money, you don't. And yet God, it's all about what God says. David understood that. And David said to Saul, your servant was tending his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be just like one of them. Don't you love that? This uncircumcised Philistine will be just like one of them since he has taunted the armies of the living God. He understands. You're not taunting me. You're not, uh, no. You are taunting the army of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear. He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. And then under his breath as he was walking out, he's going to die. <laughs> so giant slain faith must be developed. It must be developed over time. Someone asked years ago, someone once asked Paul Harvey, anybody old enough to remember Paul Harvey? Oh, look! <laughs> We're all old here! No, but anyway, this was a great guy. Someone once asked Paul Harvey, the journalist and radio commentator, he said um, he wanted to reveal the secret of Paul Harvey's success. Listen to what Paul Harvey said. I get up when I fall down. I get up. When I fall down, I get up when I fall down. You see, giant slaying faith has got to be developed over time, over a lifetime. For David, he had only had a, a brief life at that point. 
but his faith in God had been being developed while he was being obedient and he was tending the sheep. The story is told about three guys hiking through the woods and they all of a sudden they came to this raging river and they're like, how are we going to get across? The first guy looks up into heaven and says, oh God, make me strong enough to be able to swim across this river. Poof! He's got big arms, big legs. He jumps in and he swims across. It takes him two hours, but he made it. The second guy saw what happened, looked up into the heavens and said, oh God, Give me the tools so that I can cross this river. Poof! There was a rowboat appeared. He got in it and he rowed across, almost capsized, but an hour later he was across. Third guy looked and said, Oh God, make me smart enough to be able to cross this raging river. Poof! God turned him into a woman. He looked at a map and walked five minutes upstream and crossed over the bridge. The men hate me right now. The women love me. Hey, I'm coming up on 39 years of marriage. I've learned a few things. All right. Let's keep, we better get back to the word. Those guys are looking at me. <laughs> Giant slaying faith must be in, what do you think the fill in the blank there is? Must be in God. Giant slaying faith must be in God. Then the Philistine came on, read, follow along with me. Then the Philistine came on, he approached David with the shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him for he was but a youth and ruddy with a handsome appearance. The Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come out to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine also said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, oh man, this is like one of my favorite lines in the Bible. You come to me with sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted this day. Listen, he goes on and on. He goes, this day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And all God's young people said, yeah, that's better than any video game. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver, deliver by sword or spear, but the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Giant slain faith must be in God. Giant slain faith must be in God. Giant slain faith must be in God. Corey Ten Boom resisted the Nazis by, by hiding Jews in her home, I think up in the attic. And uh, her and her family both were involved in this holy endeavor against that evil, wicked Hitler and his, his government. And unfortunately, they found out about this, the, the tyrannous government, and they arrested Corey Ten Boom's family threw them in a concentration camp and where they later died. Corey Ten Boon um, just barely made it through the war without losing her own life. But I want to tell you, she understood that giant slaying faith must be in God. Her trust was in God. I'm going to tell you right now, you got to listen to me, please. If we trust the government to save us, we're in trouble. When the government is run by wicked and vile, God-hating people, let me say this, you can't trust them. I'm not speaking words that are anti-American at all. I'm speaking words of emphasis. In an ideal world, 
We have to have trust for our governing officials. If you agree with that, say amen. amen. We do, and I thank God for the men and women that have risen up and they operate as righteous men and women. And I can tell you, I have a certain amount of trust for righteous men and women that are in seats of power. I do. But ultimately, my trust is in the Lord. And, and I think if we're not careful, congregation, in this turbulent time for our nation, as our republic hangs on by a slender thread, and I don't say that lightly, please do not make the mistake of trusting people who are gaining power. Don't make the mistake of trusting people who are gaining power in our country. If they think it's okay, to murder 62 million babies. You cannot trust anything that comes from a person that thinks that's okay and says we're going to do more. We're going to empower Planned Parenthood more. You cannot trust that governing official. If you agree with that, say amen. amen. I can give you scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture, unbelievable amount of scripture where God is screaming out. Put your trust in me, not in man. And I understand, I do understand, if there's not a healthy, a healthy amount of trust for those that would lead us governmentally, the system won't work. I get that. I get that. That's why we got to be salt and light. That's why we got to work hard. We got to pray hard. We got to get involved. We got to get engaged. But ultimately, the point there in your notes comes right from the Word of God is giant slaying faith must be in God. Must be in God. <sighs> Turn to the last page in your notes. Would you turn to the person next to you? in a non-COVID-19 SARS-2 <laughs> expression, maybe just whisper so you don't spittle on their face. <laughs> the battle is the Lord's. If you believe that, tell the person next to you, the battle is the Lord's. Oh, hold on. Some of you are having a hard time being convinced. Turn to the person on the other side of you and tell them the battle is the Lord's. Oh, oh, wait, wait, one more time. Talk to yourself and tell yourself, the battle is the Lord's. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it is. Okay, let me tell you why I had you repeat that three times. Because I needed it. <laughs> we do not need to tuck our tails between our legs. <laughs> we can be humble and loving and bold as a lion. This guy was a little runt. David was a little tiny guy. And yet he knew that the battle belonged to the Lord. And so he stood up against that giant Goliath and he won. Okay. If you are a life group teacher for any age group in our church right now, Stand up. If you're a life group teacher for any age group, stand up. Stand up. Don't be bashful. Yeah, stand up. Stand up. Are we getting everybody standing up? There you go. Look around, y'all. All right, y'all can be seated. Listen, if you trust one of your life group leaders to teach you the word of God and lead you towards Christ, you're in good shape. I want to tell you, these folks have been vetted. You're in good shape. If you trust them to teach you the word of God, if you trust them to lead you closer to Christ, I believe there is warranted trust for them with the highest authority for the word of God. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you trust one of these wonderful life group teachers to pilot a 747 across the Atlantic, you're going to die. 
you're all going to die. You guys may love me and have a lot of trust for me as your pastor, and I do have a doctorate, but it's not a medical degree, it's a PhD. If you trust me to take out your appendix, you're going to die. You're all going to die. So, the object of our faith is so important. We've got to seal this in our brain. The object of our faith is important. And the object is God. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said it, shall he not do it? Hath he spoken it, and shall he not make it good? God, and God alone, is trustworthy. My wife looked at me uh, the first few months of marriage, and she, this is almost 39 years ago, and she said, she quoted a psalm to me, and essentially the psalm was instructing my wife, don't put your trust in a man, don't put your trust in men, mankind, but put your trust in God. I'm going to be honest with you men, that made me feel very uncomfortable. Why? Because men, you know what I'm getting ready to say. Because I wanted my wife to feel I am Superman, that I'm invincible, that I can protect her, that I can provide for her, that I can do all those things. You can trust me. And then she quotes this psalm to me. By the way, she has borne out to be the greatest, most godly wife I could ever thank God for. But let me tell you something. The longer I've lived, I may be a very trustworthy man, but I'm glad she's got it right, that ultimately her trust is not in me. Her trust is in the Lord God. And that's so important. If you don't understand that, ladies, or you don't understand that, gentlemen, if you don't understand that, here's what happens. See, only God with 100% certainty can say, I can protect you. Only God with 100% certainty can say, I can provide, I will provide, and I will meet all of your needs. See, what can happen, and I know it sounds terribly morbid, but it's true. You ready? I'm one heartbeat away from leaving my wife. Now, let me say, let me say what I mean by that is, if I'm living and she's living, if she ever were to leave me, I'm going with her. We got that established. Divorce is not an option between me and my wife, but what I mean in terms of life and in terms of death, none of us are guaranteed another heartbeat, right? And so if her trust is really in me above the ultimate trust in God, she'd be devastated. And by the way, I know she would miss me, but if she's got it right, she's got it right, she'd make it through. She could make it through anything. My wife ever left me and passed away and went home to be with the Lord, my human response is, I don't want to live, Lord, take me home now. And every married, happily married person understands what I'm saying. But the reality is, is God is our ultimate source of trust. We trust in Him, God and God alone. Hey, by the way, look at the time, we're on the final point. Just remember, it took me a whole sermon to develop one point last week. Giant slaying faith is contagious. It's like the new variant form of the SARS-2, except positive. The new variants that they're coming up you know, with, uh, they're, they're saying it's more contagious. Okay, so let me say, it's bad. You don't want it more contagious with like a SARS-2 thing, with the COVID manifestation thing. What you do want to be contagious is your faith. And it is. Look at the passage with me. Samuel 17, 1 Samuel 17, 48 to 52. Then it happened when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David that David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand into his bag, took from it a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead so that he fell on his face to the ground. Thus David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and he struck the Philistine and he killed him. But 
but there was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword, drew it out of the sheath, and killed him, cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now get this, this is where I extract or I exegete the point that giant slaying faith is contagious. Verse 52, the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the slain Philistines lay along the way to Shorim, even to Gath and Ekron. So what happened? Saul and uh, David's brothers, Eliab and the other two, uh, they're all cowering. They're all afraid. Their hearts are filled with fear. But when a young shepherd boy named Dave, David, whose trust was in God and God alone, who was more concerned about God's reputation than even his own, when he stood up in faith and he acted on the faith, what happened? It emboldened the faith of these cowardly children of Israel. You don't underestimate the power of your faith, parent, to impact your children in ways you can't even comprehend. Your faith, your act of faith and obedience, yes, during a time of pandemic, to obey the Lord Jesus Christ and gather together in one place at church, the ecclesia, for your faith responding or, or resulting in obedience, your kids see that and they say, dad or mom or dad and mom, they're not cowards. They're following the Lord. I'm going to follow the Lord. No matter how hard it is, your faith is contagious, parents. Your kids are watching you. They're listening to your every word. They don't look like it. They're like, whatever. Okay, they're not saying whatever anymore. They're just kind of ignoring you and going back to their stupid smartphone. Which you're going to get censored on in a few more months. Giant slaying faith is contagious. Okay, hang on. Young person, you're at school. Maybe you're doing it online, but some of you are back at school, and you're at school. And, you know... Nobody seems to be talking about anything to do with faith in God. They're talking about weird stuff, you know, and, and all of a sudden you step up and you speak up in the name of Jesus and you exercise faith. You think you're not influencing someone, but I'm telling you, your faith will spread. Your faith will be contagious. There will be some around you that hear your faith and it will grow their faith and then they're going to get bold. Some of you are having a hard time believing that. So I was newly married, and believe me, I took seriously that idea of providing for my wife. So I was working 60 hours a week at Florida Power Corporation, and I mean, I worked hard. There was a young man there named Chris, and I can use his name because it ends positively. There was a young man there named Chris, and, and this young man despised me, not because I wasn't personable, not because... I wasn't loving, I was friendly and loving and winsome. Got along with everybody, helped anybody and everybody. Well, but I was bold about my faith, I shared Jesus. And also he was a lazy slob and I worked my rear end off. And that bugged him, kind of like union, some union workers. They, they look at the guy that's producing and they're like, hey, hey, slow down, you're making us all look bad. You know, we need to take three or four men to do that job that one can do. Anyway, Chris, back to Chris. So I exercised faith. I never wavered into faith. I was persecuted. He led other men in the plant. When they were looking at their girly pictures, and they'd pull them out during break, sorry, evil, wickedness, lust, pornography, it was bad. I stayed away from it. They made fun of me. Accused me of being effeminate or whatever. They had their fun. That's all right. I blessed them in the name of Jesus. Called them perverts under my breath. I didn't really, but I thought it. But anyway, here's what happened. Years later, Angela said, you're never going to believe who's contacted us. You remember that guy, Chris? Anyway, this guy somehow tracked us down. And man, he was so impacted by my words of faith and the way I lovingly presented it. Guess what happened? This guy got saved and he was a preacher. He became a pastor. 
Isn't that awesome? Giant slaying faith is contagious. We must act on our faith, even when it seems all around us people are not. Peter would have never walked on water if he had not stepped out of the boat. If Peter just took one foot and touched the water and kept one foot in, he'd have never walked on water. We got to act on our faith. We got to get out of the boat as an expression of faith. It's one thing to talk about it in the security of this space at Stepping Stones. It's another to live it out and to express it. I'm telling you, we got to jump out with both feet to live for the Lord, to serve the Lord. Now, I mentioned at the very beginning that perhaps some have come and are part of this service today and and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ personally. There's maybe never been a time where you've asked the Lord to forgive you of your sins. The reason the members of this church gather and get equipped and do what they do and give and why we do all that is we want to see more people come to Christ, to faith in Christ. We want to see more people becoming fully devoted followers of Christ. So right now, on behalf of this congregation, most importantly, on behalf of Jesus Christ, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ personally, if you not ask Christ to forgive you of your sins, then the biggest giant in your life right now is that giant called eternal death. And one day, if you die in your sins, if you die without accepting Christ's gift, of forgiveness, you will spend all eternity separated from God, spiritually dead, spiritually dead in hell, but very much so alive and able to experience pain, the pain of fire, the pain of being tortured forever without relief. And the Bible says, whoever will call on the name of the Lord can be saved. The message of Christianity is a positive one. It's represented by the cross. And Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins and my sins and for every sin ever committed. But it will only apply to our lives if we individually accept it. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes right now, please. If you're here today, maybe you're listening to this over the airwaves. But if you don't know for sure that all your sins are forgiven, if you don't know for sure if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven. Uh, and you've got that big giant of eternal death looming over you. I'm asking you to accept Jesus. You say, how do I do that? The Bible says if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible further says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Listen, you are a whoever. Each of us are a whoever. Just put your name in there and call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. I can't save you. This church can't save you. But Jesus can save you and he will save you. If you want to receive Christ, do it right now. Pray something like this. Pray this prayer of salvation. Say, Lord Jesus, I don't want to die for all eternity in hell separated from you. I'm asking you, Jesus, take away my sin. And to give me eternal life. Save me. Save me, Jesus. I'm trusting in you alone. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. The heads bowed and eyes closed. No one looking around. If you sincerely prayed that prayer of faith and you meant it. Right now, slip your hand up. Slip your hand up right now. In the sanctuary, wherever you are. God bless you. Put your hand back down. Thank you. Is there someone else? Maybe you've received Christ by watching this on Facebook Live or YouTube. Contact us. We want to share with you some information that will help you grow in your newfound faith. Christians, still heads up, bow, nice closed. Christians, giant slaying faith. It's got to be developed. Would you anew and afresh just reconsecrate your life? To walking as a man, a woman, a young person of faith. Exercising that giant slaying faith like David did. Would you recommit to do that? If so, quietly slip up your hand right now. I want to pray for you. Raise your hand up. Hands going up all over. God bless you. I see your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless us all with uplifted hand who are desiring your supernatural divine help 
in living out our giant slaying faith, being empowered for you because we recognize the battle belongs to the Lord. Thank you for growing our church, Lord God. And it's in the peerless and matchless name of Jesus that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may look up. In just a moment, we're going to uh, continue to worship the Lord with tithes and offerings. I want to thank you so much for your faithfulness, congregation. It is amazing what God has been doing during this pandemic in a time when they when they're projecting that thousands and thousands of churches will basically bankrupt or go under because of this pandemic. In a time like that, I report to you that the finance team tells me the receipts are up in our church. And I wanna tell you of God's goodness. In a time of pandemic, not only have all the needs been met, and y'all have seen it. You've seen us help out family after family after family who've lost their jobs because of the pandemic. And we as a church, a community of faith, help them out financially. You witnessed that. You saw that. Some a little, some a lot. But this church, your church, God has empowered us to do that. And we've done that. But if you'll look out, that awning and that covered in area that's still considered outdoor space for outdoor worshipers, life groups have been meeting out there, that was paid for with cash because of the faithful giving of this congregation. Glory to God. There's a $52,000, 720 square foot young adult building within two weeks the young adults will occupy. That is paid for cash. I say that to give glory and honor to the Lord, not for you to become complacent and go, good, I don't need to give. <laughs> See, God's not as concerned about the gift as he is the heart of the giver. If you agree with that, say amen. amen. So with this said, look around. What we and the leadership team have been noticing, we thank God for the parking lot where we've had people continuing to worship through the broadcast right here on campus, for the covered awning, for the foyer, for the sanctuary. But folks, in a time of pandemic, ready? The real elements of it, and there are real elements of it, and then the perception part of it. Um, this sanctuary, although we are less than half capacity in this space, is really maxing out. And we need, we need to do something about it. And so I've been praying with and talking and praying and talking with our leadership team. And there's a consensus. We need to move forward in faith with a building campaign. Right behind this building here, we need to put a Christian life building in. Um, it's not going to come cheap. We'll do our part to have the cost down as much as Possible. We know, you know how we can stretch a dollar in this new church, but we need money. But I promise you this, as today we begin a faith building campaign, let me say to you, I promise you this. Number one, we're not going to bring in an outside firm to raise money. I am not going to subject the sheep of this flock to some manipulative outside group that takes 30 cents for every dollar that's raised off the top. Thanks, but no thanks. We'll follow God's word. And what we'll focus on is what? Building people, building people's faith. And when God gets our heart, what in the end, what does that mean? If God has your heart. God has your pocketbook. God has your wallet. So we'll do it that way. We'll focus on faith, building our faith, our hearts being more fully in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, our hearts more fully um, empowered to say, yes, I want to help my church that God's called me to, to reach more people. Right now, let me tell you what's happening. I'm getting emails. I'm following up with phone calls. This church, some weekends, we're blessed with 12 to 15 guests. That's a lot for out here in the country, wouldn't you agree? What I'm hearing back is this from some. It, it, it felt so full. 
in the sanctuary, I, and, and I, I've seen them walk up, look, and then they kind of pull back, and maybe they go out to their car or under the awning. Folks, we're not even half full in the sanctuary, but we're in a pandemic. So ha it used to be 80%, didn't it? Fellow preacher man back there, you know about that. It used to be you could basically fill a place up to about 80% capacity and then what? You better have another space bigger to meet in or you're pushing people away. I think the new normal is somewhere probably close to about half your capacity and then you start repelling people. How many of you want to repel people from hearing the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ? None of us. <laughs> How many of you want to reach more people for Christ? Raise your hands. <laughs> okay. I do. It's going to involve us. It's going to involve each and every one of us walking in faith. I just wanted to float that out there today. And uh, I'll continue to bring messages that will hopefully inspire us and build our faith. And uh, in the end, every time I've walked a flock, a congregation through it, using Christ's word and the focus on building people's faith, God has always met the needs. Amen? And so let's do it. Let's pray. Let's seek the Lord. And uh, he'll be glorified. Now, with all that said, um, everything we will do in this faith building campaign, we need, to, we need to do beyond our normal tithes, our normal giving. If we don't, if we take normal tithes, normal giving, Let's say to build a Christian life building, we'll, we'll have plenty of money, but basically they'll foreclose on the property because we're not paying the mortgage, we're not paying the light bill, we're not, so we can't do that. It needs to be faith, it needs to be an offering beyond. So we'll talk more about it, we'll lay out, you know, a biblical kind of way that we're going to do it decently and orderly, but just be praying, praying, praying. Now right now... We want to continue worshiping the Lord by returning a portion of what he's blessed us with in tithes and offerings. Amen and amen. Thank you. Glory to God. Um, real quickly, as we're drawing the service to a close, um, there are two midweek options starting this, uh, I believe they start this Wednesday, the 20th, right up here. Financial peace taught by our very own Deacon V. Harris, and then we're going to have the essentials, a deeper look at the core foundations of our faith, taught by our very own Bob Hyatt, our prayer leader in our church. That starts this Wednesday. Um, you, you need to make contact, get signed up um, for those, and come and be a part of it. It's going to be good. It's kind of our way of kind of slowly moving back into a full-blown Wednesday evening midweek shot in the arm. Um, by offering those two options right now, and uh, we'll keep doing that. Next week, Winter Fest, January 24th, soup, chili, stew, crock pot, potluck, immediately after the worship service. Sign up at the information table out there. Uh, this is going to be fun. We just need to fellowship and, and enjoy one another. That's next Sunday, right after uh, the morning worship service. There's a lot more. Please look in your worship folder for that information. Right now, though, one of our very own, uh, Lisa Donos, uh, is going to be leaving on an 18-day medical mission trip with Hope Ignited. I don't know if you know, but she is a nurse, and we thank God for her. One of those precious attenders here about a month ago fell out there and hit her head and she's fine but I just was sitting there thanking God for Lisa Donos and she was right there and Angela had the the emergency room or the hospital on the line and and Lisa said respirations she she goes on all this like medical talk you know and I'm just sitting there like going yes she's a member here <laughs> anyway we want to have a special prayer I'm going to ask um I've not pre-asked for this so I'm Thank you for, for flexibility. I want to ask one of our life group leaders, um, Wayne Dishman, who served as a pastor for decades, uh, to come up. I want you to lead in this prayer. Uh, she'll be heading out. When do you leave out, Lisa? I leave Thursday morning. West Africa for 18 days. 
we will miss you. We want prayer cover for you. And Wayne, are you willing to lead in that? Okay, so what I want to do is life group, life group leaders, life group leaders come up, um, including children's. Karen, if you'd come up as well. Deacons, we got a couple of deacons counting the money right now. But if you're a deacon, V, if you can make your way up. We're going to lay hands on Lisa from behind, and then uh, Wayne's going to lead us in that prayer, just asking blessing and protection. Come on up. Well, Lisa, I think we're going to have you stand about right here, and then if we'll, everybody come behind her. If you'll come over and lay hands on her, and I'm going to have you come in here. Okay, we'll pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you thanking you for the heart of your servant, Lisa, for her desire to meet the needs of people in physical and spiritual ways. And so, Father, right now, we pray for an anointing on Lisa. We pray that your Holy Spirit would just overwhelm her, consume her, overpower her, and prepare her for what lies ahead. Father, we pray as she goes to meet physical needs that you would open doors to meet spiritual needs. Father, we don't just pray for uh, physical needs to be met. We pray for transformed lives through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we don't want them just to hear about you through Lisa's words, although we pray for that. But through her attitude, through her character, through her heart, may you be made known. And Father, we also pray for Elisa, that you, through your Holy Spirit, would speak to her heart as she's there, that you would give her clarification regarding this uh, long-term possibility, that you would make yourself known, that she would not come back wondering, but she would come back knowing, I have heard from God, and this is what he's told me to do. So Father, we pray for protection, we pray for safety, we pray that Jesus would be made clear in his name amen amen thank you thank you y'all may be seated well the service is drawing to a close i am so glad to have been with you today um, in the ecclesia of the gathering of christ church it's a beautiful beautiful thing i want to commend you congregation you're inviting friends and relatives associates and neighbors weekly and uh, every week there seems to be more guests coming to hear about Jesus and his new church here in Northwest McKinney. It's exciting times ahead of us. There's about 25,000 houses and apartment units slated to go right around the church here. Unbelievable if each home represents Three people, four people, you can see we will be 75, 100,000 people that we want to get the gospel to. Amen? We need to stay vigilant. And y'all, stay faithful. I'm so proud of you. Why don't you look around. If you see somebody you hadn't had a chance to maybe get to know, again, respect. Show respect for uh, some social distancing there. But try to get to know somebody that you don't know real well a little bit better next week is going to be the best opportunity though with our winter fest potluck god bless you you're dismissed